Good afternoon, and welcome to another River Landing Conversation. I'm Jim Kalaki. I'm here with Helen Shields, and we are delighted um, to have the opportunity to be your guest um, for uh, about half an hour or so. We are even more delighted to welcome Dick Hoban, who, um, along with his wife, Dorothy, has been a resident at River Landing for about a year, a year and a quarter, a something like that. And um, Dick will enlighten us on what he's been up to for the past uh, several years. Um, 80. 80, oh my God. <laughs> One of the best looking 80s around here. Um, as you know, uh, if you have joined us before, our point in these conversations is to have a chat with a senior staff member or a resident and uh, find out a bit about their lives and the amazing things that um, they bring without exception to our community at River Landing. Um, Helen, welcome again. Thank you. It's lovely Good to, to be, here. be here with you. And um, Dick, We'll, we'll start the ball rolling and, and have a chat. Okay. We know that friends call you Dick. Is that your given name? Um, do you know how your family came upon that name? And how do you like the name? <laughs> well, my given name is Richard. Well, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I think uh, when I was given the name Richard, my mother was in love with Ricky Nelson. <laughs> And she thought oh, she was going to call me Ricky. As it turns out, everybody in my family called me Richard. No one oh. ever called me Richie or Rick or Dick or till the day they died. And even today, my brother and sister call me Richard. So that's my given name. But you took on Dick. I took on Dick because I, at some point in my my puberty years and. I thought that was more masculine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Dick or Richard or Dick, who, whoever you are today, um, where did you where did you come from? Where were you born, and where did you grow up? I was born and raised in New York City, in the borough of Queens. Uh, for those of you who know something about New York City. Um, my dad was a New York City fireman, and uh, I guess you would say we were um, blue collar, a blue collar family. And I, I, I say that because it, it had some impact later on. Um, I, uh, I, I, when it came time to go to high school, uh, I went to St. John's Prep which was in the borough of Brooklyn. And it was a half an hour commute. And it was uh, rather expensive in terms of the, optim the, op the option of having a public education. And uh, years later, Dorothy asked my dad, uh, I know it was a stretch for you to send him there. Uh, why did you do that? And uh, my dad said, very wise man, he said, you had to know Richard. I had to send them to a place where they said, where are you going to college, not are you going to college? Uh -huh. So, you know, that was a stretch. And, and I, I went to the prep, and I went there for four years. It was probably a, a big impact on my life, because judging from what my father said, you can imagine what kind of child I was. <laughs> But when it came time to graduate, he said to me, uh, I, I really can't afford to send you to college, so I want you to go to the uh, guidance director and find out what you have to do, but you have to go to college. So I went to the guidance director, and he set me up in a job with the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and uh, I went to St. John's University at night for seven years. Wow. <laughs> it was a long haul. Um, but I say that because most of the people that I know today 
all had, you know, went to college days and had this big college experience. That's something that I did not have. Yeah. So at any rate, I, and during that seven years, I took a year off and uh, went into the Air National Guard. And uh, I did that because Vietnam was on the front burner back then, and I didn't want to get drafted mm -hmm. and into, I didn't want the seven years to become 12 mm -hmm. or 13. Yes, yes. So I did that. And the, actually, when I was in the Air National Guard, I, I, uh, that was another turning point because at that point, I was kind of wandering through college, you know, at night. And uh, I, I had an opportunity to rethink where I was going. I was around 20 years old at the time. And I decided that uh, I should become an accountant, which uh, kind of fit in well with my anal attention to detail. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I kind of changed my course of studies and took accounting. And, uh, but uh, as I said, at that point, I was working for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and, and I hope there's nobody here that is a Metropolitan alumni, but I hated it. <laughs> I was an insurance trainee, and, and I knew, I realized during that year in the Air National Guard, where the government did most of my thinking, and <laughs> supported me, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and I realized I was going to become an accountant because that's where all the money was, as opposed to like becoming a doctor mm -hmm. or, or a lawyer. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I also decided that I had to get out of the Met because it was not working for me. Yeah. And uh, I, I looked around for a job at that time um, there were, you know, these uh, employment agencies in New York City, and one of them sent me to the Port Authority. And uh, I had remembered going for my working papers when I was a teenager, and I said, I'm going to work for a state agency. This is not going to work. This is going to be worse than the Met. <laughs> and when I got there, I was pleasantly surprised, and I went to work there as an accounting clerk. And 38 years later, I retired wow. <laughs> as the manager cool. of Port Newark. So I, oh. it was, it was, it worked well for me. And during um, that time, did you say, you, like, when you think of your hometown, is that? Do you think of New York? To the, to the city, or yes, uh, I guess I do, and yeah. and it's it's you know, it's kind of like rooting for the Giants, you know, they're terrible. <laughs> but you, I had season tickets, and I can never get away yes. from watching the Giants on television, even though I rather watch the Panthers now because they're a much better team. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least at the moment they are. <laughs> at the moment they are, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just struck, Dick, I, I, when I came to New York, which was around about the same time, maybe a year or two later, um, I had never known about the concept of people working and going to school, going to college at the same time. Uh, that was just new. At, at home in Ireland, very few people went to college in the first place, but they went, like you were describing, mm. full time to have the college experience, and that. And I remember at my work in in the city, um, with working with people who work all day and go to school at night, and I just once I got to know this and and got to know some of them, my admiration for how they combined all that. I mean, it just blew me away. So I'm um, honored to be reminded again of what, what amazing stuff that is to, to be able to do that and, and keep it all together. So You know, I, I, <clears throat> as I say, when I went to work for the Port Authority, I, one of my first jobs 
was to, uh, I was an accounting clerk, but then I then became part of junior management and I wound up auditing construction contracts on the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I worked on the construction project itself and it was right near NYU. So I wound up going to the Stern School at NYU at uh -huh. night for my master's. Wow. So it, this, the seven years stretched, <laughs> and it just goes to show you how much common sense I had. <laughs> I, um, uh, it stretched into another five or six going for my yeah, master's. But you ended up with a degree you needed. Yes, you know, I, I, my dad raised it, you always do what you have to do, so. I, back in those days, uh, it was, if you, unlike today, I think, if you had a master's degree, it, it kind of really went a long way. Today, I'm, I kind of get the impression that everybody's getting one, so. <laughs> People who are at River Landing that you've met and we've met often have moved around quite a bit. Where did you live before you came to River Landing and other than New York, when you, when you left Queens, where did it take you? Well, <clears throat> we when I at the Port Authority, I, I met my wife. She worked. Dorothy worked in the office next to me, and uh, you know, I would I would kind of I don't want to say I stalked her. That was <laughs> not the case, <laughs> but I followed her a lot, and we wound up meeting and, and getting engaged and getting married. And, and about, we lived in Queens for about, I'm gonna say four years, and then we moved to New Jersey. Okay. And uh, you know, I find it amazing that I meet people here uh, that have lived, as you say, all over the world mm -hmm. and, and traveled a lot. When we moved to New Jersey, we lived here for 30 years. <laughs> you know, I was not not one for change, and uh, we lived there for 30 years. And uh, when it came time to retire, we started to look around. And again, with my uh, anal attention to detail, we we looked at about uh, a dozen different golf course developing communities in this North Carolina, South Carolina, mm -hmm. Virginia area. And uh, we wound up moving to uh, Cypress Landing in Chacoinity. And Chacoinity has become almost like a password. It's like Sanford <laughs> <laughs> uh, here. And uh, we, we lived there for 20 years. And then we moved here. <coughs> So we didn't. We didn't move um, you've told us a wee bit about your work and um, being an accountant at the Port Authority. Um, what did you do by way of hobbies and other interests, um, or were you were you commuting and just dealing with the family? <laughs> um, well, most of the time. I think um, Dorothy and I both skied, and I uh, talk snow yeah. ski. Yeah. So um, I think that was that was a big part of our earlier years. Mm. We we looked forward to uh, to getting away in the winter for a week and skiing <clears throat> in Vermont. In, in New England, in yeah. New England. We also uh, went out to uh, Colorado, mm -hmm. Vail, and a couple other places um, and skied out there. In fact, our son, uh, later on, years later, <laughs> after he had a, uh, an abrupt breakup with his girlfriend, decided he was going to ski. And he packed up his forerunner and took off to Colorado. So it had a big impact on his life too. <laughs> but we 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 did we skied, and uh, we had a neighbor 
who uh, in in New Jersey who built a uh, a big uh, racket club into a racket club. So mm -hmm. we became we became tennis players as well. And uh, I played tennis two hours every Friday night with seven other guys. So we and did that for years and years and years. And then when I got time, getting close to retirement, I said, I don't know if this is something that I'm going to be able to do when I get old. So we, I took up golf. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, um, as I hack around a bit myself, that you are a considerable golfer. And you had the oh, good you, fortune. You, you've been very informed. <laughs> oh, well. Well, for those of you that don't know, if you don't care, this is just going to take half a minute. Um, but um, Mr. Hoban, shortly after arriving at River Landing, had the good fortune to have a hole in one. And uh, his name is etched forever in, in the, the annals in of the, um, um, anno, uh, whatever of, <laughs> uh, of the golf shop here for having achieved that hole in one. And um, it's something to which I humbly aspire to at some point in my life. But um, <laughs> anyhow, um, uh, if I could go back to the Port Authority for, for a second, because I've always been fascinated. The, the Port Authority, I believe it's of New York and New Jersey. Is that correct? Yeah. And uh, that covers transportation there. And I've always just been in awe when I go to New York or when, even when I live there of how things get from A to B, more or less on time, how transportation gets from A to B, more or less on time sometimes. And mm -hmm. uh, that. But the, the operation, the, the Port Authority itself must be a huge operation. Yeah, they, it's uh, actually this is the 100th anniversary of the creation of the Port Authority. Uh -huh. And it was the first authority in the United States. It was created by Congress in uh, 1921 when New York and New Jersey were kind of at a commercial war over each side of the, of the uh, New York Harbor, who would get the, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, maritime uh, transportation. So they created the Port Authority to kind of eliminate that problem. And uh, as it turns out, uh, today they have five, five businesses. Um, they have airports, aviation, which is Kennedy Airport, LaGuardia, Newark, and hmm. two others. And they have tunnels and bridges, George Washington Bridge, Lincoln Tunnel. Those are probably the, more, the ones most people would know. <clears throat> Of course, the World Trade Center, they built and, and uh, operated the World Trade Center in the early years. And uh, do, they, do they still, have, is the Trade Center still part of the well, portfolio? Well, uh, now it's, uh, it's, it's leased. I see. This, mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because as fate would have it, uh, when we built the port at the World Trade Center in the in the 1960s and 1970s, <clears throat> it was kind of like a white elephant. It was it was an enormous building. Mm -hmm. We were having trouble renting it, and then eventually it just blossomed and became an international icon, you know. And <clears throat> and then um, the city. It, it, the Port Authority doesn't pay any taxes, state or local taxes. Mm -hmm. So that property became very, very valuable. And it was actually built, it was, a, it was a political decision to get the Port Authority to redevelop Lower Manhattan. And this is the way they did it. They built the World Trade Center um, because there was, uh, there was a lot of old tenements down there and everything. And, it's a whole other story, but so they built the World Trade Center, and it became very valuable. The city of New York then saw the fact that 
they had created this monster that wasn't giving them any money. So they, they started this political movement to get the Port Authority to pay more taxes or do what. So what they did was the Port Authority decided that they would maintain ownership, but that they would lease out the whole complex to a real estate company, and they would pay taxes to New York as a, as a commercial entity. Mm. And uh, they did that in 2000. And then we all know what happened in 2001. And the interesting thing was, and after the building came down, uh, there was all this talk about not building it again and making it into a, a national memorial. The fact of the matter was that the company that leased that property continued to pay rent while the buildings weren't there. So they had a, a, a contractual right mm -hmm. to rebuild something or, to, or right. to have something on that property. And it would take an awful lot of legislation and everything else to rid them of that right. So ultimately, as we know, the Port Authority rebuilt a building there. And as far as I know, they have the lease on that building as well. Wow, fascinating, yeah. fascinating. The, the I, I didn't think, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, Do you have a favorite kind of music in your pastime? Or? In my past, yeah. I grew up in an era of folk music. Okay. Yeah. And you know, like the Kingston Trio and mm -hmm. all that. That was and what came after that I didn't pay much attention to because I was too busy going to school and working. So mm -hmm. I yeah. you know but I would say folk music. Good. And I don't really listen to music that much. Uh, actually now I'm getting into country music. I don't know any of the songs, but it's on my it's on my my car radio. So whenever I drive someplace, <laughs> I don't know who they are. I don't know, but I like the sound and I well, like the story. It's yours to listen to. Well, uh, <laughs> um, Dick, one of our um, questions here says, um, what do you think folks might be interested in knowing about you that we haven't yeah. covered yet? I knew, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I, you know, I, I said to Dorothy, they're going to ask me this question. I, she said, you can tell them that most people who meet you think of you as an extrovert. And actually, you're an introvert. And I really don't want people to know that, so let's keep it among ourselves. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to get into it with people, but I, and and I have actually been told that by professionals. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, when you're working, we have these uh, executive team building things, you know. So I had a professional tell me I was an introvert. <laughs> And I just took his word for it. I do have trouble, to be honest with you. You know, I don't know why I'm telling people this. <laughs> this is kind of stupid. But I do have trouble and always have in large social gatherings. I, I you know, there's this discomfort. And speaking of weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> um, the other favorite, well, one of the favorite questions that you know is coming too is that if all the details are taken care of, who are three people in, in time, at any time, that you would love to sit and have a chat with and maybe a meal and you know, why? When, you, when I first heard that, I said to myself, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and the reason I said that was because 
I said to myself, here's a guy that could get thousands of people listening to him, and he didn't talk about cutting taxes, <laughs> you know, so I won't go there. But I, I think, I think the, the one person that I'd really be interested in talking to was my great-grandfather. And, and the reason I say that was that uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Dorothy and I and my brother and sister and their spouses took a trip back to Ireland. And uh, we did the graveyard tour, you know. <laughs> but um, I, I happened to meet, at that time, a cousin that I never knew I had. Uh, she called me about a month before we left and introduced herself. And, and we wound up getting together the first day that we were there. And it turns out, and, I, and this part I knew, it turns out that my great-grandfather had 11 children. And when I say he had 11 children, it was in a cottage maybe four times the size of this stage. I mean, it was, it was really small. And, and my mother's father was the oldest, and this woman's father was like 15, 16 years down the line. So she was really my mother's cousin, mm -hmm. but she was my age, if you, uh -huh. if you follow yeah. that. So anyway, we met her, and she took us back to the, this cottage that my grandfather was born in and that my great-grandfather owned. And um, she told us that the 11 children Every one of them, with the exception of her father, was sent to the United States when they turned between the ages of 19 and like 21. And this was in the late 80s, so it was after the famine, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not really sure what was going on there, but what I came to realize is, is that how desperate it must have been to send your children. I mean, there was no internet. We didn't have Zoom. <laughs> there was, there was, wasn't even really phones. So you, you do this knowing you're never gonna see them again. And you leave the child knowing he's never gonna see his parents again. So I would, I would just like to, to get a sense of, of what that had to be like. So, and maybe it would put in perspective some of the things I see today as well, you know, where you see all this chaos and desperation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I would like to talk to him. And are there others that... Any other special people that you no, think about? Not really. I, I'm the most interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't imagine who else I might want to talk to. Yes. And here we are. <laughs> and here we <laughs> are. Do you have a favorite Riverlanding experience, or more than one that you've had since you arrived? Uh, well, I guess the whole in one probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> I find. Uh, not any one thing, no, because I haven't been here that long. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, I'm, I'm going to say half the time we were here, we, we were really yeah, confined. Uh, yeah. I only got to meet people really months after mm -hmm. we moved in. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I think that the thing here is, is the safety of it all. Mm -hmm. um, Dorothy and I both feel that... Uh, you know, we couldn't be in a better place given the times. And most of the people here, I find, are somewhat like ourselves, you know. Um, they come from someplace else. They're all very interesting. Um, a lot of them play golf. <laughs> most of them much better than me. So... Uh, it's, it's, I think that the most impressive thing to us has been 
this fact that uh, the place is, as we were told, is very well run. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I've told this story to a couple of people. We were on uh, a cruise around the British Isles <clears throat> two or three years ago. Um, if, if Tom is watching this, he might appreciate this story. And uh, we went to dinner on the ship one night, and there was two couples sitting next to us. <clears throat> and they said, where are you from? And it turned out they were from North Carolina. Oh, we're from North Carolina as well. Um, they were from the Raleigh area and said, oh, we're going to be moving out your way shortly. Um, where? We're going to place River Landing. It's, it's near High Point. I've been there once, so I'm really not and he started to laugh. <clears throat> and it turns out he was a retired attorney who had been on the, the board of the, of the Umbrella Presbyterian Organization. And uh, <clears throat> he said to me, you're going to one of the best-run places in the whole organization. So I said, well, that's, that's good to know. Tom, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, as you um, anticipated this conversation, um, and we asked you several weeks ago to start anticipating it, um, as we start to wind it up, are there points that you thought about that should be covered or that you wanted to cover or, uh, or that, we haven't, that we haven't talked about or questions that we haven't asked that you think no, I don't think so. Actually, it, this conversation went very different than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be a lot more about my career. <laughs> and and that's, that's what I was, I said, uh, you know, how do I do 38 years of, but I'm glad we didn't go there. So, so <laughs> it, it, it went you're, very well. You're, I'm, this, this begs uh, this question, though, what you just said, uh, given your profession as an accountant, and you can hit me for this after we're finished, if you like. Um, does it add up to the right number? I don't know what you mean by that. I'm, <laughs> I'm just being a smart aleck. Actually, I, just, <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> I started out as an accounting, but I... I, I wasn't an accountant for yeah. most of the time. So it... the, let me just go back to one other thing that I, I remember. This is um, my version of a question that didn't get asked, was how many people roughly actually work in the Port Authority uh, <clears throat> or when you were there? <clears throat> when I was there, it, it reached 10 or 11,000. Wow. <clears throat> but that was... The Port Authority was primarily a, uh, a construction company. Interesting. They, they built tunnels, bridges, airports, the World Trade Center. When they got finished with the World Trade Center, uh, there was a lot of politics became involved, as I said, because they, they owned all this real estate. And uh, the construction piece of it died down, and they became a maintenance company. And at that point, there was a big, what's the word, reduction in force. And they went from 10 to 11,000 down to 8,000. It was like a 20% wow. reduction in force. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where they are today. They're about 8,000. They have, at one point, I was responsible for putting together their, their annual budget. And... Uh, I looked up in in nineteen last year that operating budget was eight and a half billion dollars, mm. so it's it's a huge, a huge mm. organization, and and they're they can't rely on tax money. They've got to be self-supporting. Interesting. So that's wow. uh, they they have eight thousand employees that get that done. They're very efficient and very well run. They had a lot of problems. Um, during 
George Washington Bridge Gate or whatever they called it. Um, and, you know, but now they seem to be getting back to getting the politics out of it and they're yeah. getting back on course. Did um, they have anything to do with maintenance of the Statue of Liberty? No. Okay. No. They, the Port Authority is only involved in businesses that can be considered interstate. That's why it's bridges mm -hmm. and tunnels mm -hmm. across the Hudson River and, and commercial facilities mm -hmm. that benefit both states, like the mm -hmm. World Trade Center and the airports. Mm -hmm. Right. How what, you, what is, do you have? Wait, what has been your biggest surprise <clears throat> other than being quarantined when you first arrived at River <laughs> Landing? <laughs> <clears throat> I think the biggest surprise really was that, and, uh, that the friendliness mm -hmm. of the people, um, you know, especially during the quarantine, we, we were in a building which was apart from this, so we, we didn't really know much of what went on here, and we had... Um, there are 18 apartments in our building, and the 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 individuals there, the cohesiveness and the friendliness was was very apropos given mm -hmm. what went on, and that I found really remarkable. That that given when you wore a mask and you had to stay indoors, and they were bringing their food to you, that that this group of people managed to have a a thirsty Thursday in the garage. I guess you've heard about that, you know. <laughs> they got together every Thursday in the garage and met each other and got to know yeah. each other. I found that, you know, very encouraging. And I figured if this is what the rest of the place is like, <laughs> we're home free. All right. I had <laughs> friends of ours who came here, by the way, who, uh, who lived in New Jersey with us and retired up to Cape Cod. And they had a house in Florida, and they came through here and spent two days, not on site, but they came in and we took them around. And, and when he left, he said, you know, Dick, you really hit a home run. You hit it out of the park. And I think that's probably the way yeah. we feel. Well, thank you for joining our conversation. And... Hitting another home run out of out of uh, it's the studio fun. park. Um, <clears throat> it's been a joy getting to visit with you and um, to to learn uh, particularly about the the structure of the Port Authority, which um, we can wish a happy hundred birthday to yeah. um, <laughs> this year. That that was interesting information. Thank you for joining us. Um, this afternoon. We look forward to having another River Landing conversation at the same time next week. Good afternoon. <laughs>